ahead and start. The seats are more sparsely populated, as always happens, as the semester winds down. Um, I hope you guys are having a good semester. You've got, what, about a month left, a little over a month left of the semester. Um, I had a fun time on tour. That is a lie, but um, <laughs> I am, I'm happy to be back from tour. I'm actually flying out uh, on Monday, hopefully, to Dubai. Um, there's a passport issue, so who knows if I'll actually be going to Dubai. So maybe I'll be here next week on Thursday. Uh, no, if, if, if I'm here on Thursday, that means bad things have happened. Um, but I have an assistant flying to D.C. to hopefully pick up passports. Uh, so let's see how that, how that works. Um, so today, because I've been on tour, um, I think we're going to do a world building uh, because this, is, uh, this lecture is fun and upbeat and I can jump right into it. So we'll do the last plotting lecture next week. Um, and we'll, I'll try to leave plenty of time for questions next week as well. Not next week, the week after, hopefully. Uh, hopefully I'm not here next week. I love you all, but hopefully I'm not here. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about Sanderson's Laws. We're going to talk about world building magic and um, kind of digging in deep into making your setting. Um, and then two weeks from now, next week, you'll have a sub. Two weeks from now, you, we will do plotting number two. And then we will do business of writing number two, where we talk about agents and things. And so you can kind of plan for what's coming up um, and things like that. And this, uh, the list of things we're talking about is pretty easy today because it's the first law, the second law, the third law, and then the zeroth law, um, which is kind of like a little tradition in science fiction that you have a zeroth law, so I have one. Um, so these, uh, these laws, where do they start? They start with a story, as many things do. I was at my very first Worldcon. Uh, that, well, my first Worldcon that I went to as a published author, it was in Boston. This is like 2005, I believe. I'm bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I've just had a book come out. I'm super excited by it. And I get to be on paneling at a Worldcon, which is a pretty big deal. The Worldcon's where I'd been going and seeing people like Terry Pratchett on panels. So getting to sit on a panel and talk, I, felt, I just felt very excited to be on my first panel. And you fill out these little questionnaires for your paneling. and. I filled it out, and the panel they chose to put me on is How Does the Magic Work? Which I thought was a pretty good match for me, right? Um, even back then, I knew this was one of my things. I was excited about it. We got on the panel, and the moderator got up and said, all right, I'm going to direct a question to the panel. Uh, and, you know, what is the first thing you think about when building a magic system? And Brandon will let you speak first which was great. So I said, well, obviously, good magic systems have rules. Now, this is something I had learned from Orson Scott Card in his How to Write Science Fiction Fantasy book. My favorite magic systems had rules. And I figured I was doing something safe, right? I was going to give my first discussion at a panel, and I was going to pick something that would not be contentious, that good magic systems have rules. I said this, and then the other people on the panel all turned toward me and said, you idiot, no. If you put rules on your magic system, it ruins it. And then we spent like the next half hour arguing about this point, about how, how magic systems, I'm like, no, no, this is like the fundamental thing. Magic systems should have rules. And they're like, no, no, no. If you put all these rules on magic systems, then it, it, you, there's no wonder or excitement in your story. And your magic instead just kind of turns into a video game. And we argued and we went back and forth. And I got done with this panel. And I thought, how could somebody have such a huge ideological difference from me in something that seems so fundamental? So I started looking at magic systems. And I started fi trying to figure out, how is this all working with people? And I realized there are some really good magic systems out there that don't have rules, or at least where the reader doesn't understand the rules. And for this discussion, 
Whether the reader understands the rules or not, that's the fundamental point that we're getting at. If there are rules, but they're never made clear to the reader, that's the same storytelling lies as they're having no rules. And so Tolkien is the one you can go back to. Um, he uses both systems. The One Ring, you basically know what it can do, at least in Frodo's hands, right? What does the One Ring do? Makes you invisible. Makes you invisible and turns the Eye of Sauron towards you, right? Uh, it's it's a, a definite advantage and a definite flaw. It's a very rule-based magic system of the style that I really like to use. Um, it's, it's, it's a great thing. But what can Gandalf do? Whatever the story seems to require. Whatever the story seems to require. Everything except getting the ring to Morador, right? And beating Sauron. And beating Sauron, yeah. Like, um, so the, the Tolkien fanatics can go and be like, oh, no, 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 here probably are the bounds of Gandalf's power, and he's one of the Mylar. I'm, I don't think he's actually the Mylar. I, that's a joke. Yeah. Uh, it's Mylar, right? Well, yeah. Yes, yes, there's no L. Mylar is like a... Oh. It wasn't me this time. Oh, hi. Hey. It's okay. <laughs> we, we've, we've all done it. Well, at least two or three of us have. Um, <laughs> so he, you, you may know all of Gandalf's, Gandalf's powers or whatnot, but really the reader doesn't. And that's actually okay. I realized I enjoy the Lord of the Rings. I enjoy Gandalf's scenes a lot. Uh, I think Peter Jackson, this is one of the things he was able to capture in the films, is we don't really know what Gandalf can do. You're never even sure if he's using magic but it's always awe-inspiring, right? <laughs> um, so I started developing this kind of rule for myself. And you're giggling at something, and it's really w weirding me out. You're yeah, OK, it's not, not my flies down or something like that. Yeah, you'd warn me, right? Oh, this is going to be on the internet, Brandon. Um, so I started developing this rule. And the idea was that the magic systems I liked seemed to walk this balance. either. They explained the rules and then made the rules a feature, like the One Ring, right? The fact that when Frodo puts on the One Ring, it, the, the Eye of Sauron turns toward him and it slowly corrupts him, yet he has the ability to turn invisible. These are all features of the story. It's what the story centers around. He uses that to advantage and to disadvantage through, throughout the story. We understand what Frodo can do with this ring, and therefore we are excited by seeing how it is applied. That was kind of one style of magic. And then there was the other style of magic of, I don't really know what's going on here, but when it happens, I feel a sense of awe and wonder, though it doesn't ever seem to affect the story in a really intimate way. Um, and when it does, it has these huge ramifications. And the, the idea of Sanderson's first law is, is the most complex of them. And it just says, and I'm going to try and write this out, I'll try and write it out so you can actually read it. Then we'll see how this goes. Um, your ability, meaning me, these are all laws I kind of wrote to myself, to solve problems with magic in a satisfying way. This one gets an underline. is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. All right, so there's a couple things going on with this rule. Now, as I said, the your in this is me, and that's kind of legible. That's good for me. Um, the your is me. These are not necessary laws that I think everyone needs to follow because rule number one of this class and writing instruction is try it out if it works for you. Keep using it. If it doesn't work for you, throw it away. Most likely, you will adapt it to your own needs and then it will become a tool that, you, that is useful for you. But the idea here is, if you want to do a lot of problem solving, 
with magic. And the emotion that you're looking for from the reader is, oh, that's a cool twist. That's a cool application of the magic. If the emotion you're looking for is, oh, they're in this problem. How will they use the magic to get out of it? Oh, that was a clever way to use the magic to get out of it. If that is the emotion that you're searching for, having a rule-based magic system is going to help you enhance that. It's going to let you tell stories where primary protagonists have access to magic, use it frequently, and can depend on it so that the magic becomes a tool for problem solving. If, on the other hand, what you want your magic to do is to give a big sense of awe to the reader, to put them in a wondrous place. Um, and the magic does not need to solve problems in a satisfying way. Then the magic, not being explained or having rules, can be used to create this sense of awe and wonder. And of course, you can have a balance between the two. You can use both in your stories. There are different ways to go on this. Now let's talk on this satisfying way, because this is an important element of this. Um, this is a greater rule than just magic. What I've realized is that all of these, these laws are really just kind of core storytelling concepts. And this is the concept of proper foreshadowing. Proper foreshadowing leads to that moment of Ah, oh, I should have seen it. Ah, oh, this, this is great. And it leads to a certain emotional response in a reader. But you don't always have to look for that satisfying response. The, the show of this, the explanation of this is, once in a while, you will have a character show up at a last minute to save the protagonist somewhat unexpectedly. Now, using this storytelling trope is very different in the first third of your story as opposed to the last third of your story, okay? What happens? Your main character's in, uh, in a tough position, and, you know, someone rides in and saves the day in the first third of your story. What kind of, what's the purpose of that in a story? Can you think of reasons why you would have that in your story? Introduce a new character. Introduce a new character, yeah, um, yeah. Basically, yeah. Show he's awesome. Show that the, the, new, the new character is awesome, right? Yeah. Raise the stakes. Raise the stakes. Okay, sure. Show that the main character is not as prepared as he thought he was. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Relieve or build tension. Yeah, you can really you can have kind of a small moment of of tension and release of tension. If you do this too many times, you'll actually get a counter uh, effect to that, where people are like, oh, someone always shows up and saves them. But if you do it once or twice and begin the story, you can have one of these effects. Again, as chefs rather than cooks, you're like, okay, why am I, why am I doing it like this with this unforeshadowed character? Well, I want to introduce this character in a cool way. So the problem is not solved in that case in a real, in what we call, I call satisfying under this definition, in that it was well foreshadowed and a cool twist of the plot, but it doesn't need to be because it's achieving a different emotion, all right? If you had the same thing happen at the end of the story, the lack of, satis um, uh, of a satisfying, um, you know, it, it's done foreshadowed, right? The lack of that satisfaction is actually going to have a different effect on the reader. How are they going to feel if an unforeshadowed somebody shows up and saves the day at the end? Any, any, how would you feel? Oh, um, I get upset. You get upset? Yeah. It, the Jesus machine. Yeah, 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 deus ex machina, or yeah, the god from the machine, how, whoever, Greek people should tell us how to say that. But it's, it, if you don't know that phrase, uh, it comes from back in Greece where they would actually have the gods solve the problem at the end of the play because they're like, oh, we've written ourselves in a corner, the gods solve it. Um, it. It has this emotion to you. However, if you have it well foreshadowed, if the reader understands the rules of what's going on, then you have a moment like the end of Star Wars, where this exact thing happens, right? Han shows up and saves Luke. The protagonist is about to be destroyed, and an unexpected force comes in and saves them. Why does that work instead? Because it's foreshadowed. Because it's foreshadowed, because it's the resolution of a character arc. Um, the same thing happens with magic. The number one complaint that people who don't read fantasy seem to make about it. I hear a lot is, oh, that's the genre where anything can happen, 
right? This is the, uh, this is the you know, people just make stuff up and then they make up a way out of it. Well, that can be a legitimate complaint about any genre. If you're writing a romance and you have not properly foreshadowed, you know, the two characters actually hooking up at the end, you can just write, and they hooked up, the end, right? <laughs> That's not satisfying. You can solve any problem with a, with a wave of your authorial magic wand um, in any genre that you want to write. The goal is to decide the emotion you want to have and to explain things well. Uh, a great example of this um, in plotting. So I'm going to use Lord of the Rings again because a lot of people have watched the movies. I'm going to explain two of the movies, OK? And I actually think that uh, there's an element of the third movie that really fell flat for me as a, as a viewer that was done very similarly in the second movie and worked. And these two things, they're basically the same effect. In one film, Gandalf shows up with an army unexpectedly. If you remember in the second film, they're trapped at Helm's Deep. Uh, Tolkien nerds, don't kill me if I say something wrong, but they're, they're trapped at Helm's Deep. <coughs> they're, <coughs> they're all doomed. Aragorn and Gimli are like, we're going to go out and we're going to, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to have one last hurrah uh, killing orcs. And they kill like, a, you know, 10,000 of them, but there's a million, so oh well. Um, <laughs> You know, the riders ride out. It's all really cool and dramatic, right? Um, and then Gandalf shows up and saves them. In the third movie, they are at, is it Minas Tirith? Can someone tell me? What, Minas, uh, the, the white tree place, right? <laughs> yeah, the white tree place with the crazy guy. Um, and they're, again, being overwhelmed. They're going to, you know, all, it, it's all terrible. And then Aragorn shows up with a bunch of ghosts. And the ghosts save them, sweep the, the bad guys away. It's only one aspect of the story. It's not the ultimate climax. But they, it, these two different sequences had a very profoundly different effect on me as a viewer. And the, we'll, we'll start with the, the one in the third movie, with the ghosts. I didn't feel as a, as a viewer, for whatever reason, that this moment was earned. It felt like we are losing. And there is no way to win. Oh, good, Aragorn showed up. And we have now been rescued. And it didn't feel like anyone's like, you know, if only we had the ghosts to save us. There was no setup. There was no, you know, there's a little bit of Aragorn wanders off. But it, basically, the heroes failed and had to be saved by the god from the machine. That is what happened in the second movie, but it worked for me. Why did it work for me? Anyone got any guesses? Yeah. Because Gandalf said, look to, look to the east on the third day. Yeah, yeah, the sunrise of the third day or whatever, right? Well, also the army that Gandalf shows up, isn't it the... Um, the, the, the riders. The riders that had been banished? Yes. So it was, it was the people of Gondor coming back to save the people of Gondor. Right, right, right. Well, not the same, not the same. Oh, Tolkien nerds are going to kill you. It's okay. <laughs> it was a foreshadowed army who had been banished, who yeah, right. went with Gandalf to protect people instead. Yeah, they hadn't been banished. They'd ridden off because the king had gone crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. So, all right, back here. Well, the, the ghost army, most of those scenes are in the extended edition. So, like, they were cut out and they actually so, Yeah. So, all of that foreshadowing is there, or is it just kind of like a It's not there for when I watched the movie in the theater, so that doesn't count. <laughs> um, but maybe, you know. Yeah, and, and it's different in the books. We're not talking about the books. We're talking about the theatrical release as storytellers. I don't want you to defend the Lord of the Rings. I want you as storytellers to say, oh, this, you know, these had two different effects. Maybe they both worked for you. That's fine. But this is what I started doing, analyzing. We'll go here and then in the back again. When the ghosts show up in the third movie, it cheapens the sacrifice of everything that's come before. Right. If they'd only shown up three hours earlier, then this whole thing would have been a piece of cake. Yeah. In Gandalf's case, if he had even shown up a day earlier, it still would have been a battle. Right. Well, in the, yeah, go ahead. We'll go back here and then I'll, I'll talk some more. Um, in Gandalf's case, the foreshadowing had happened um, like early enough or whatever that by the time he showed up, I completely forgot about it. Yeah. You'd forgotten about it, but when he showed up, they played over the look on the morning of the third day or whatever. And then you like look at the sun and like the riders right over it. And you're like, oh yeah, those guys. 
right? This is a completely different emotion. We're going to get off of this topic for right now. Uh, you can write down these thoughts because this is what you should be doing. Um, but the idea is that these were two different resol the same resolution to two different plot setups. As a viewer, I felt in the second movie, I was promised if you guys can survive three days, you will have resources come and help you. That was the promised setup. And like she said, I had forgotten that. But when it happened, I was reminded of it. I was so into the movie that um, I, I, had, I had thought, oh, they're just doomed. Then I remembered, oh, no, they just have to survive till Gandalf returns. And it worked. In the third movie, I felt like the setup was instead, you guys have to beat this army. And if you don't, bad things happen. Oh, you didn't. No, bad things aren't going to happen. It's OK. Aragorn's cool. Um, and so this has a lot of relevance, again, to how you design your magic systems. And you should be thinking about this. Maybe this rule won't work for you. But if you properly foreshadow, you can have those moments where the reader says, oh, this power plus this power together do what they're doing right now. And you can have that moment where the reader, I, I personally like it as a reader and as a writer, when the reader figures it out like a paragraph or two before it happens. And they're like, oh, what if they did this? And then it happens and it works. And it just kind of all clicks together. Now, that is one type of storytelling. And I want to emphasize that you can go the other direction. You can have, um, I really like Naomi Novik's uh, Uprooted. Uh, which came out uh, last summer. This is a very, what we would call soft magic system rather than the hard magic system. It's very much more on the sense of wonder side than on the rule-based magic side. There's a little bit of rule base to it, but it's mostly sense of wonder. And the book works perfectly because the story is really about two characters and their relationship. And the magic is kind of unknowable, and that's part of what's cool about it, is they're delving into this magic but it's, it's related to ancient things. It's related to myth and fairy tales. And we're never quite sure why it's doing what it's doing. But it always leaves us with a sense of wonder when it happens. The proper emotion is expressed for that book in the story. Um, it doesn't solve their relationship problems, which is the main conflict. It does help them with some of the external problems. But even though it, it feels occasionally like a deus ex machina, it's OK because the sense of wonder overshadows that, if that makes any sense. I would suggest that as you read books, you watch for these two kinds of emotions. And you see how different authors are using their setting, their world building, particularly their magic or their science, to create these two different emotions in readers. I do want to take a moment and talk about the idea of a hard magic system versus a soft magic system. Because a lot of people get mixed up about what do I mean by hard. When I say a hard magic system, I mean one where the rules are explained and repeatable. This does not mean that the magic has scientific origins, OK? Most superhero stories are extremely rule-based hard magic systems, particularly these days. Even though the fact that they have powers in the first place makes absolutely no sense. We have the X gene. And the X gene, for some reason, creates a different ability in everybody who has it, turns some into frogs, and it makes other ones able to turn into ice and shoot ice from their hands. I don't know. <laughs> right? This is not a very scientific magic system, but it is very, a very hard magic system, particularly in the films. If it's repeatable, and what? It's repeatable um, and dependable. You, can, you know what's going to happen with it, right? It, if you say, for instance, now, comic books aren't always the best at this, you know, uh, particularly Silver Age. Um, but they're just like, oh, he needs a new power. OK, he has a new power now. Um, <laughs> that happened a lot. But what I'm, I'm talking about this idea of Nightcrawler can teleport, and it does this, and you know, it's repeatable, and every time it kind of has the same effect, and then he uses it to do lots of cool different things. That is a rule-based magic system, OK? 
And then you can play off that as a writer by making the things that he does um, exciting. You're like, oh, we, one of the, in X-Men, I believe it's true, um, where we have Nightcrawler's main character. He says, you know, I can't teleport to places I can't see, but I'm scared of doing it. So what it does is it sets up a rule. It sets up kind of a limitation of that magic. And then it sets up a character moment for him where later on, when he teleports to save someone in a place he can't see, you know that's very hard for him, but he's capable of doing it. So he overcomes his character um, limitation at the same time that he develops more ability in his magic. And it doesn't feel like a deus ex machina. He didn't manifest a new power. The rules were explained to us. And then the story manipulated those rules in a way that was satisfying. Okay? Questions about Sanderson's first law. It's kind of the doozy of the laws. Um, but it's been very helpful for me in a storytelling set. So let's jump to Sanderson's second law. So. <clears throat> Sanderson's second law, these are, they, they get a little easier. Sanderson's second law is, is much simpler. It's the idea that um, flaws are more interesting than powers. W-E-R-S. Um, and that pen doesn't work real well, so we're going to hide it over there. Um, flaws are more interesting than the powers themselves. This is, again, a kind of core storytelling concept. Your story is generally going to revolve around what your characters have trouble doing, around what the magic can't do, rather than what it can. Uh, this might seem counterintuitive. You're like, I've developed this cool magic system, and now you're telling me I'm going to write a story about what it can't do. But the same goes for characters. If you're developing a good character, they're going to be interesting. They're going to be good at some things. Then you're going to create a story that tests them in ways they are not prepared for. The story is about what they can't do or what is hard for them to do rather than about what they can do. The things that they can do will definitely be an aspect of this story and will be a fun part of it. But the story is about overcoming flaws, limitations. Um, a good example of this, uh, again, something a lot of people are familiar with is Superman, right? Anyone, uh, well, what do Superman stories usually revolve around? Kryptonite. Kryptonite, why? Because they make the story interesting. Yes, here is this person who is basically deific and can do anything. Now we're going to introduce one of three things to a Superman story. One, the thing that takes away all his power so he has to be like a normal person. Two, someone equally as powerful as he is. Or three, a woman. <laughs> right? Superman stories revolve around those three things. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I've seen some interesting Superman stories that revolve around uh, introducing a situation that he can't fix with his power. Right, that's the third situation. I made it jokingly as a woman, but really it's, it's usually him integrating to human society or trying to do relationship stuff or figure out a way you know, to achieve something that his powers just can't solve. A problem that does not revolve around brute strength, um, or being able to fly, or being able to shoot lasers from your eyes, um, which are really interesting that those are like the canon abilities Superman ended up with, because he had a ton of them way back when. Um, I loved, I've mentioned the one where he, can shoot, he once was able to shoot like little versions of himself from his hands. Um, <laughs> that one's real fun. Um, but, but yes, yes, there are a lot of Superman stories that, that, that revolve around this. Um, this is based, you know, I use this as an archetype because it's easy to see, but Lord of the Rings is another good example. What can't Gandalf do? Destroy the ring on his own. We need a little hobbit to do it instead. The story revolves around something that's very hard. A very small person in conceptually what's the hardest thing for them well, you are very small from this little town you've never left before. You need to go across the entire map. We'll show you the map, right? You are the smallest person in the entire, um, entire world, and you need to go from here over to here. Um, and the eagles can't take you because of reasons. Um, so, 
Yes, because like what? The ring wraith flying things will come eat them or something. Um, but the idea is that this story revolves around what is difficult to do. Now, when you're designing your magic systems what, and your, 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 um, your world building, I suggest that you kind of keep this in the forefront of your mind, that flaws and limitations of magic are more interesting. Now, you'll remember, I believe I talked about the difference in my distinction between a flaw and a limitation, right? Um, uh, and it's, it's a little less clear cut with magic systems than it is with characters. But the idea with a, with a magic system is, you know, the flaw is more like kryptonite takes away the powers. And the limitation is more like Superman can shoot lasers from his eyes, um, but, you know, I don't know, not from his hands, right? Um, the, the limitations are the scope of the magic, and the flaws are the things that, the, that are broken about the magic, if that makes any sort of sense. It's a per purely arbitrary definition that I use to help me visualize how I'm going to build my magics. You can have your own purely arbitrary definitions. You don't have to use mine. Um, Mistborn, uh, one of my books, is an example of this. Uh, Mistborn... In Mistborn, people can push and pull on metal. This is uh, basically just telekinesis, right? You've seen it a million times. Uh, everybody uses telekinesis in basically every magical story ever written. From, you know, the Sword and the Stone animated movie to Star Wars to, um, to the X-Men to everything else, right? We move stuff with our mind. Uh, in which mountain they do it by playing a harmonica, I believe. Um, right? Uh, there's, there's an old joke for you old people. Nobody laughed at that because they, they haven't seen that movie. But it's a good movie. Actually, it's not. It's terrible. But, <laughs> but I loved it as a kid. Um, but the idea is it's basically telekinesis. Um, it is an extremely limited version of telekinesis where, in a lot of ways, the, in fact, basically every way, the magic would be less interesting if you could move anything you wanted with your mind in any direction. And instead, I'm like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could drop a coin, push against it with your weight, and it would throw you upward because it's pushing against the ground. And so you have this whole vector dynamics. You can only go directly again, away from or pull directly toward your center of gravity. Um, and you know, weight is a very big issue. To it. These are all limitations. These all make it weaker than what the Jedi use, right? Which is, uh, I've never really been able to figure out. Because at one point, Darth Maul just like points at something and points at something else and it just kind of flies over to that thing. Um, and, and so it's like, okay, whatever. But um, that magic, the, the force has some cool things about it, but the telekinetic part always feels flabby, right? It, it's just show, it's all flourish. Um, whereas in the stories I was telling, this telekinetic part worked really well and people really like it. And it's a big selling point for the books. It was a big selling point for me writing the books. Why is this? It had an interesting limitation. And it's expressly, expressly weaker in every way than um, what you would see in another story. Yet in, some, in most ways, it works better. Yes? Does the distinction between flaws and limitations become more important to you the harder your magic Yes, yes, definitely it does. Um, yeah. Is the inability to use allomancy on aluminum and silver a weakness or a flaw? Um, I, would, I, I would look at that as a flaw rather than a limitation. Uh, but it's my arbitrary distinction, like I said. They're all just kind of how the magic works. Um, the idea is what the magic, what can't the magic do, or what limitations are bound, bound the magic. So limit, you know, limitations are what is it bounded, and uh, what can't it do is kind of the flaws. I don't know. It, like I said, it's completely arbitrary. It's just something that I kind of fiddle with when I'm writing, um, and it helps me to kind of wrap my mind around different types of limitations on the magic. Okay, so. What, what does this have to do with, with storytelling? Well, be searching for the problems. Be searching for what your characters can't do. And when you're designing a magic system, if you're like, wow, this feels like a magic system that I've seen a hundred times. Everybody does this. How can I make it my own? Well, one of the best ways is to make it more limited. Make it more flawed. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, the one that Scott Card talked about a lot is cost. Adding a cost to a magic is an easy way to make it have, make it more limited. Um, 
and then it's an easy way to connect it to other things. If, for instance, the cost is economic, you can work it into the economy of the story. You'll see that I really enjoy this type of thing. Right? This, is, this is a big uh, thing in my stories. Um, it's probably because I love how Dune works. Uh, in Dune, the magic is an economic magic, first and foremost. Without the magic, you can't travel between planets. If you can't travel between planets, you cannot have a space empire. Um, therefore, the spice must flow, right? Um, and so the economic cost of that story is what drives the magic system, in my opinion, and is part of what makes Dune so great. Um, and I, I just happen to like that aspect of magic systems, but it's not the only way. Um, you know, famously, I think it was Scott Card who said, if you have a magic system that when you use it, one of your grandparents dies, then you can use that magic system in a maximum of four times, um, maybe fewer times, and it has kind of this, like, this, this more, I, 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 it's an emotional, and uh, well, what would you call that cost? It's a, uh, it's, what's that? Social. It's social, like a moral cost, yeah. There you go. A moral cost. Um, the David Farland's Rune Lords has a nice moral cost to it, right? You can steal um, like somebody's uh, metabolism and brand it on yourself, and then you have double metabolism and things like that. Really cool economic and moral uh, cost to your magic system. A lot of these, you know, we sacrifice a goat and something happens, um, are like, you know, these, these like really bizarre and twisted moral costs of magic systems. Um, what other kind of cost can you guys think of for a magic system? Physical. Physical. Okay, like, you know, like, yeah, 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 fatigue, yeah. Um, this is like, this is the old standby of magic system costs, right? Um, it is, it is not a cliche, but it is the standby. So you need to be aware that if you use it, it will feel a little more flabby. Um, I've used them before, and they work out fine, but they aren't usually as powerful as the other things. Um, there are some books I've read where it's like, you know, it's a cost, you get really tired, but the, the reader's like, yeah, but they'll always be able to summon that reserve. And lo and behold, the writer, every time the character gets into a sticky situation, summons a reserve of strength. It's like how gunmen never run out of bullets until it's dramatically important for them to do so. Your, characters, your readers know that your characters will never run out of strength until it's dramatically important that they do so. And so this one is <coughs> a dangerous one for you to rely on because it's going to naturally push your magic to, toward being softer despite pretending to be hard, which is a dissonance that can get you in trouble. Would you recommend us having our character fail if we're going to try? Uh, try fail. Would I recommend having your character fail if you're going to try? I would recommend that there be lots of conflict in your story. Um, one way to do this is to have someone fail several times at something before they succeed. If that is a natural way that your story can progress and be satisfying, then yes. But it does not need to be the only way. Um, you know, that whole thing that Mary, that Mary likes, the yes, but, no, and. You can do the yes, but a lot. The character succeeds, but the problem was bigger than they thought. The character succeeds again, but it causes unintended consequences. The character succeeds again. Like a lot of the, the spy thriller genre with you know, Superman characters in the, the lead role have that sort of plotting. They don't fail very often. The, yeah, James Bond type things. They, they, they succeed, but they succeed in a way that is not quite enough or that there's, not, there's something they didn't realize. Like you know, they get the person they were chasing down but that person you know, has, has, has started a bomb somewhere else, they need to go get that. It's the kind of Jack Bauer thing. It's always every, you know, every episode that he succeeds like five times, but it never works enough. That's a, another way of storytelling, and you don't have to use either one of those if you can write a satisfying story that makes good promises and fulfills on them. Um, don't rely on any one thing to say, yes, you have to do this. All right? Uh, so other questions on... Flaws, any other costs you guys can think of? Yeah, go ahead. Mental. Mental, okay, yeah. Um, this is the kind of, you have to study a whole bunch before you can even use it. The setup cost, or it drives you crazy, the Cthulhu thing. 
Yeah, don't ever read the book. If you ever play a Cthulhu game, don't read the book. Not sure what to call it, but Frodo using the ring turns the eye towards him, so... Yeah. <laughs> right, right, gives the enemy information. Yeah, I mean, these are all kind of different realms of cost, if you start thinking about it. That's a, that's a very good one. So, yeah, cost, the, that's just one way to do it. You can also kind of put boundaries on the magic, the, the actual limitations. The magic can, you know, you could go crazy with this. I can, I can fly on every other Tuesday. Um, that might be, you know, a little silly, but it's that kind of thing. I can only push and pull on metals. I can't push and pull on other things. Um, I can fly, but only if I've eaten my spinach in the morning. Whatever. You know, you can put these boundaries on your magic. Or I can fly, but I can't go higher than 10 feet in the air. Or, you know, I, I can fly, but when I fly, I become nearly weightless, and so the wind can blow me around. Um, coming up with things like this immediately make for more interesting stories than I can fly. Um, each of those things that I said, I immediately said, oh, that's an interesting way of taking it. What would I do with that story? As soon as you put some interesting boundaries on your magic system, you are going to have a natural feeling of intrigue by the reader. And, oh, I haven't seen that before. It feels really new to them, even though they have seen a magic system where people fly, like, even more than they have seen magic systems with people with telekinesis, right? All right, any questions on Sanderson's second law? Okay. I'm going to take that as you did understand it, not as this is all really weird. Um, let's go to Sanderson's third law. And this is go deeper into a magic instead of wider. Um, uh, this one I started to kind of get a grasp on when I was trying to build the Stormlight Archive. And this is one that Hollywood has a lot of trouble with. This is the idea that a, a fewer number of things in a world building situation that are well explored will actually feel like a wider, cooler world than a large number of things explored very shallowly. Okay? So let me give some explanation of this. Um, when I was developing the Stormlight Archive, people came to me and said, you know, you had three magic systems in the Mistborn series. How many is your next book series going to have? And I started to get into this philosophy of, oh, I'm going to have 20 magic systems in the next one. Um, it's this sort of sequelitis, right? How many villains did you have in the first movie? One. How many villains will you put in the second movie? Well, let's do two. Third movie, let's do seven, right? Um, it's the idea in Hollywood and in our own psychology that bigger is better. But bigger can have multiple different meanings. And in this case, <coughs> we, I find that a magic system that you have explored deeply in an interesting way is far superior to a large number of things. For instance, if you're building races for your book, having two races who have re a really interesting relationship um, that you can dig into, who are fully expressed and you've spent a lot of time world building on them, will actually make the world feel larger than having 20 races that only have one gimmick to them each um, and are all really, really shallow. Um, Video games tend to have a problem with this. Large worlds. The big thing in video games right now, if you video game, is we're going to create procedurally generated worlds. Uh, we're going to do spaceship simulators where you know, there are millions of planets you can visit. And each of them is as boring as the one before it, right? Um, this, is a, this is a big issue. Um, where ha being able to say there are 10,000 dungeons you can visit and every one of them is boring is not a very good game. What's that? Did you just joke? Like, yeah, it is so true. Um, and that makes really cool marketing speak for the box. But once you visited the three archetypes of dungeons they come up with and realized that if they had just put in 10 dungeons that they'd spent a lot of time on, you would be excited to go to the next one and you would actually spend way more time in the game. Um, 
will make a better story. The same thing's going to happen with you with your magic. So instead of saying, I am going to develop a book where there are 30 different elements, and I'm going to have different people using these different elements in really cool ways, you might want to ask yourself, wait a minute, can I back up? Can I take a couple of these magics I was planning, add some really interesting flaws and limitations, add some really interesting character ties in these magic to the people who are in the world? Can I make them opposed to each other? Can I make it so that they are tied to the economy, to the religion, to whatever all that stuff we brainstormed during the first world building thing? If I can tie these things all together to a couple of my magics, will I have a better experience for the reader? The answer is generally going to be yes. That's what's going to happen. Uh, so considering the ramifications of what you already have is worth doing instead of creating something new. Questions on this? Go ahead. So if you're developing a magic system that's going to play a fairly minor role in the story that's not going to be the point yeah. the story is based, how do you make go deeper into a magic system that doesn't derail the story and call to attention? Um, so what I would do in this situation, which may not be what you want to do, but what I have done is I have left hints that this magic exists in the world and promised that a future story will deal with it. And then I leave it alone and deal with the magic I'm doing right now with the characters using it. And then I write a sequel later on that delves deeply into that magic. Do we need to do we have to tell our reader or just do we as an author need to understand? So this, is the, this goes back to the iceberg philosophy we talked about before where it depends on your world building style, right? Um, I like to do a lot of prep beforehand so that I can then use these tools to solve problems in my stories as I go along and I try not to break my own rules. But if you're a discovery writer, if you're pantsing along, the idea should be that you think of it in the moment, right? You say, okay, I need a new power to get through this because that's totally okay to do in a first draft, guys. But I'm, I'm, these are final draft things. It's okay to be like, I don't really know what my magic can do yet. I want to have a role-based magic by the end of the story. But each time we come across a problem, I'm going to figure out what the magic could do to solve it. And I'm going to add that in as a rule. It's actually okay. Um, but what you want to do, if you're uh, a discovery writer in that situation, say, what have I already done? Instead of inventing a new power, can I take an aspect of the power I've already developed? Can I expand it a little bit further? Um, and then make it work for this situation. And then in your revisions, you make sure you set up those things as the rules at the, ahead of time. Does, does that make sense for you? Um, <coughs> I apologize. It's so hard in this class to give definitive answers because of my kind of cardinal philosophy of teaching, which is that I'm trying to give you tools to solve your problems rather than giving you hard, fast rules. Um, one thing I should mention that, that I, I should have brought up before now is that even in my fairly rule-based magic systems, I like to leave holes for the sense of wonder. What this means is I will often, and since I'm a planner, I will do this in a foreshadowing way where I say, look, this guy has a different magic. Say Zed does something weird and bizarre. We're not going to talk about it in this book. He's mysterious. And what that does is, is it gives us some of the sense of wonder. It gives us, oh, He's got something mysterious and cool. Um, another thing that I do is I often set up a rule and then try to immediately chip away at it and, exp and explain to the reader, this is not a rule of the magic. This is the way that human beings are trying to understand the magic. There are only 10 medals, but there might be mythologically other medals because we've heard rumors about them. Um, just like, you know, historically, we're like, here are the elements. Oh, we found a new one and we've added it to the periodic table. Science doesn't know everything, so I like it in, in, in my books. I kind of try to write in this. That you'll often have a scene in my book where people are like, we think this is the way it works, but the people who really know a lot of magic understand that we don't understand it nearly as well as we thought we did. We're very Socrates about our magic, right? We, um, we, we only know so much because we know how little we know about our magic. And by writing some things like this in, what I generally am trying to do is, is move my magic systems back from like a 100% hard magic system to like a 75% hard, 
hard magic system, where zero would be really soft, where there's like 25% of wiggle room and softness in this magic, where like there's still stuff to explore and discover. There are metals we don't quite understand yet, um, and we are learning and things like this. I like to do that. Um, this is more of a, hey, try this tool out, guys, than something that you need to do. Um, and if you do have a very soft magic, doing what Tolkien did, which is write in the occasional really hard magical piece of it, can help you have your cake and eat it too as a soft magic system writer. Yes, the world of magic is very unknowable. Uh, Gandalf is like kind of an angel deity thing, um, and he can do stuff. And there's all this weird stuff, and it's a wide, wonderful world, and Tom Bombadil, and Barrow Whites, and yada, yada, yada. But the, the, the Hobbit with the ring, this ring will turn you invisible. That's what it does. This one we can explain. Um, and you'll see a lot of the really soft magic systems will do that sort of thing as well. They'll add in one or two powers that are very repeatable, even if sometimes the consequences are very unknowable. All right? Other questions about uh, making your magics deeper instead of wider? OK. So we'll go to Sanderson's zeroth law. <clears throat> So I, I called it the zeroth law um, for a couple of reasons. One is because Clark and Asimov, I think, both have a zeroth law. Um, and so it's a, it's a fun kind of insider joke. Um, but the idea for this one was I was thinking about it and like, Brandon, do you, really, do you really do all this? When you're sitting down designing a magic system, do you say, ooh, what are the flaws? How do I, you know? And the answer is yes to an extent. But I'd be lying if I say that's the origin of my magic systems. That's how I, all these three laws, these are how I refine my magic systems and how I use them in my stories. Where do they originally come from? They come from Sanderson's zeroth law, which is always err on the side of what is awesome. Um, so... For me, fantasy really is about, oh, that's so cool, right? That, that's what it gets down to. We, we went and watched uh, with my kids Kung Fu Panda 3 last night. If you've seen any of these movies, they're like serious Kung Fu movies, except for Jack Black's character, who's a fanboy <laughs> of Kung Fu. And so like this enormously cool Kung Fu moment will happen, and everyone's posing. And then he's like, oh, that was awesome, guys. You know, and he totally kind of breaks out and goes fanboy. Um, that, there's a Jack Black Kung Fu Panda inside of me for all things fantasy, right? Um, when I'm developing a lot of these magic systems and stories and things that I'm doing, really the origin is, oh, super cool magical swords that you can summon, right? <laughs> That would be so cool. Everyone always does these like big magical swords in fantasy books, and that's totally ridiculous because you, you, you can't actually use something like that in a normal fight. So how can I make a story where having swords like that is the rational thing to do, right? <laughs> that is where it came from, right, is this idea of these are cool, let's make it work. Um, and that is where a lot of my magics come from. Uh, after I wrote Mistborn, I was talking to my editor. And I'm like, where, where do you think I should go next? And he says, well, Elantris had this kind of dour setting. The, if you haven't read the book, they're, they're in the city that's crumbling. Uh, everything's got this like, kind of haze of grime all over it, patina of grime on it. Everybody's miserable. Um, and then Mistborn, ash is falling from the sky. <laughs> Everybody is miserable. He's like, you should do something more colorful for your next book. And I said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Ooh, color-based magic. That'd be cool. <laughs> and that is the original story of how Warbreaker came about was, oh, color-based magic. That'd be cool. Um, so I try to keep this in mind. I try not to write myself out of what was the awesome concept that started this idea because I do want to have that sense to my books. And maybe it's, um, I don't know, m maybe it's, it's not as literary. Maybe this is a reason that people point at fantasy and shake their fingers and they're like, you know, instead of having people, you know, living in 
whatever, the Middle East and having a terrible time of their lives, you're writing about, oh, that's cool. Um, but that's what I love about fantasy is you can write about people having real problems and you can write about people dealing with issues and you can also have, ah, oh, cool, awesome swords, right? So it's kind of like all of this stuff is a nice balancing factor to me for a lot of the realism, which is also very important to a story. I want it both. Um, and I like to keep this in mind whenever I'm designing a magic system. I like to keep in mind the idea that there should be stuff about it that is just awesome. That why are you doing this, Brandon? Brandon, because it's cool. That's why I'm doing it. It's just cool. Now I'll justify it. I'll come up with rules. I'll come up with limitations. I'll dig into it. I'll connect it to, this, to the world around it. But that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because it's cool. Any questions about that one? It's the easiest of them all, I feel, <laughs> right? Um, at the end, I hope that some of these help you kind of start thinking about magic. If I get on my hobby horse for a minute or my soapbox or whatever, I get on the soapbox and talk about my hobby horse. Um, part of the reason that I became a writer was that I felt that I was being given the same worlds and magics too repeatedly as a reader in the 90s, um, the late 80s and the 90s. I felt like, oh, I'm, I'm getting all these kind of flabby magic systems. They all kind of feel the same and the settings are all like generic medieval Europe-y without, you know, I'm like, I want more. I feel like fantasy should be the genre that is the most imaginative with its settings because it doesn't even have to follow some of the rules that science fiction follows, right? And so I would suggest that these are areas that you can push yourselves further than perhaps you have thought that you can and where readers will go along with you more than you think that they will with interesting setting elements and interesting magics and different takes on limitations and things like that, okay? But write the stories that you want to write. Now, we have about 15 minutes left of questions about anything. And I'm going to try and start leaving more room for these um, at the ends of uh, classes as our class winds down. Yes? So you're reacting to the whole conversation about error burns and ghosts. Yes. So I cannot remember for the life of me if this is in the theatrical release or the extended release uh -huh. because it's been years since I've seen the theatrical and I can't remember what's what anymore. Um, I always, like, the way I saw it was that in that moment, Aragorn was, like, trying to be as awesome as Gandalf and come in with a giant... Right. And that was that culmination of he actually got to be as awesome as Gandalf. That's the way I saw it. So it was like a culmination of Aragorn's like, yeah. yes, you are capable. You can do this. That's great. I'm, it, it, I, I don't intend for a minute to suggest that my interpretation of events is the only interpretation that is possible. Um, the whole point of that object lesson is just that in watching the film, uh, it didn't work for me. This one element of this film, which, by the way, that's an awesome, excellent film and very well made, didn't work for me, and, I, and it led me toward this path of thinking. If it works for you, that's fine. I hope the path that I thought along was still useful to you as an object lesson, but I don't want to argue whether it was the right move or not um, because the point, whether it was the right move or not, is moot as long as the, as long as the lesson makes sense. All right, other questions? Uh, so what would you do if you were writing a story and how do you introduce a system where the main plot of the story becomes that it's a parent instead of magic system? How do I write um, a magic system where the main occurrence, I repeat it just in case so for, the, for those who might be watching, where the main uh, interaction with the magic is that the magic is not working anymore. I think that's great. I think it can be a, a, a wonderful story. Uh, Elantris is basically that, right? Magic stops working 10 years before the book starts. Um, and then it's a, so what you have to ask yourself is what is the emotion that you are looking for in the readers with this disappearance of the magic? What is it doing for you? And I would answer that there are lots of things it can do. But one can be you could make a mystery plot out of it. We talked about building a mystery. It, that becomes why is the magic no longer working? 
Or you can kind of get this sense of loss and regret with a we need to move forward anyway emotion from this. That's kind of Tolkien's elves, right? Magic is leaving the world and the elves are going to go away. And this is a sad thing that we're going to sing songs about, but we're not going to change it. It is just an emotion. And in that case, the story is probably something else, and this is just an aspect of the story. Um, <coughs> the main character having magic and it running out and stopping working could be an awesome limitation to the magic. As then you will need to have them learn to stand without the magic, and that's your arc for your character, is I need to be able to do this without the crutch of my magic. That's a great story also. These are all different ways to take this same story, break it down and say, why am I doing this? What is cool about it? What is going to make my story the best version of the story that I want to write? Back here. What about a story where the flaw in the magic system is that it is kind of, um, it is powerful and kind of unlimited, but you can't control it. You can't control it. So what about the flaw is um, powerful, unlimited, but you can't control it. You do see this fairly often in, ma in fantasy. It's great. Um, you know, there's, there's even an aspect, I believe, in Earthsea kind of to this, that there's unintended intended ramifications when you use magic. Um, and the idea is that you make the problems caused... You know, Again, so many ways to do this. I would say that one is that you want the reader to be scared that the character will have to use the magic because they know that it's always going to be a yes with a big but. And any time they're going to be using the magic, you have the reader be saying, no, don't do that. I know it's so easy to just use the magic, but it's going to cause bigger problems, and then it does your story then becomes a suspense slash horror story in regards to the magic, not the whole thing, but that's the emotion that you're getting. Do you see how that could be one aspect of it? Uh, another aspect of it, um, I mean, could be this magic is powerful. We're going to figure out how to harness it and control it. The bad guy's just going to use it willy-nilly. We are going to figure out what those rules are. Then it becomes, again, more of a mystery instead of this kind of suspense horror. Um, look for your emotions. Look for what the magic problems it causes or what it can't do. Um, and if what, all it can't do is be used safely, then build your story around that. Yeah? Um, is it possible to pile on too many flaws and too many things onto your magic so that it becomes yeah. like awesomely limited, but at the same time, like, what do you do with it now that it's happening? Yeah, is it possible? It totally is possible. I would say it's definitely possible. Uh, play it by ear. And again, the danger of these things is getting into the um, every, you can fly on every second Tuesday type things, right? Where if the reader has to have a spreadsheet to keep track of the magic, then you're running into issues. And you may want to back off then. The, the best magics are ones that are both elegant, uh, have elegant powers and elegant limitations. You can't always pull that off as elegantly as you want, but that is something to keep in mind. And I'd say definitely it is possible to have too many limitations, except, you know, there's one story I want to tell, maybe someday I'll write, um, about uh, a, a, um, a sapient sword, you know, a sword who claims to be the most powerful sword ever created in numbers of powers. Right? So it's, everyone knows it's the most powerful sword ever created, but then you actually find the sword, and it's like, yes, I can turn a pebble into a wombat, but only if you sprinkle time on it, right, and then kick it three times, and then, you know, suck it in your mouth, and then throw it at a frog, right? And I have, like, seven million types of powers like that. I am the most powerful sword that's ever existed, and that is true, except they're all pretty useless, right? Um, <laughs> The, that becomes a joke, but uh, I think it'll be really fun. So maybe I'll write that 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 story someday. Yeah, go ahead. How do your do your laws would would they be able to apply to writing science fiction? And if so, how do you think they need to be adapted in order to apply? The idea for these laws is that they are just storytelling laws or storytelling rules of thumb, rather than just magic. I've adapted them all to magic, but I would say you know your ability to solve problems with science. It depends in a satisfying way on how well the reader understands that science. Now, this sounds, you want to dig deeply as a chef in this. For instance, if the rule you've set up is 
if Scotty has enough time, he can fix any problem, then the techno babble Scotty gives you is not necessarily breaking your rule if the rule is Scotty's a genius. And it, there are many times where Scotty works, even though we don't know what Scotty's doing, even though what he says is not necessarily repeatable. The repeatable fact is we need to buy, you know, 15 minutes for Scotty. And if we do, he will make this work. Uh, that's kind of the Star Trek rule of magic. Um, is your, and your, your chief engineer can fix any problem if you'll give them just a little less time than they say they need. Um, <laughs> but set up that rule, right? Make sure you understand that that's your rule. Your rule is not that the reader needs to understand what a tachyon and a deflector dish can do. The rule is the reader needs to understand that data is really smart. And if you put data and Geordi together, then they can probably solve your problem if you can keep the Kardashians from blowing your ship up, right? Um, and does that make sense? And then, you know, the second law, flaws, limitations, things like this. They, they do this all the time in science fiction. Our teleporters cannot teleport through a, uh, through a shield unless you know the shield's frequency. So the story becomes, let's find the, sh the enemy shield's frequency, and then we can teleport a bomb onto their ship and blow them up, right? Or we can teleport data over there and he'll do something. Um, <laughs> but again, the, we have this fantastical technology. Now let's put a limitation on it that becomes our story. Um, so yes, you can adapt these all to science fiction. It depends on your type of science fiction. The harder your science fiction, the more you're going to have to keep to the real laws of physics. And the softer your science fiction, the more you'll want to just kind of keep to your own laws. Uh, but in both cases, the laws are important, or the rules. Yeah? What's the last thing that you read and then you go, that's What's the last thing that I read? Probably the coolest thing. Um, and it's been a little while, but kind of you, you go back, there's been plenty of cool things, but Brian McClellan's Powder Mage stuff, um, which is softer than any of my magic systems. Um, but when I read that and I'm like, oh, the story is the clash between cliched elemental wizards and all of our protagonists who are the newfangled gunpowder um, wizards who have a cool magic. This is awesome because in some ways it's the clash between the old guard of fantasy novelists and the new guard of fantasy novelists or technology and progress versus, you know, the, the status quo. That was so cool um, and it made those, that whole series for me just that one concept. So, yeah. Do you think it's awesome that we should expose ourselves to as many works of fantasy as, as possible or do you think we should try and kind of stay away from that so we're not in Oh, I think you should read whatever makes you excited to read. Um, I do think generally the rule of thumb for people is that you should read widely in a lot of different genres. And for most people, that is a good piece of advice because it can allow you to see what a different genre is doing and transpose that to your own genre and make some freshness and some newness um, to it. But at the same time, if you don't read what you're writing, then it's, a, in my opinion, a little bit like a doctor, not keeping track of what all the other doctors are doing. And so that everyone else has this brilliant new procedure and, you know, instead you're still, you know, doing what they did in the 50s. That's, you're not going to be a very good heart doctor if that's the case, right? Um, and I think you should be watching what people are doing. Uh, but, I mean, there are plenty of writers who don't read their genre at all and they do just fine. There are plenty of writers like myself who read it almost exclusively. I read nonfiction and sci-fi fantasy is basically it because I feel like I can find within sci-fi fantasy all the sub-genres that a lot of the other genres are doing. But you know, I'll read, I'll read the occasional thriller and things like this, uh, the occasional mystery, see what they're doing. But uh, I think you should read, but I'm not gonna tell you what to read. Yeah. How would you say your um, experience in chemistry or the sciences or like build, that helped you build, prepare for, or add to your Yeah, writing? so how would my experiences, so for those who don't know, I was a chemistry major my freshman year. How did it prepare me for being a writer? Um, I would say that I am a fan of pop science and being a chemistry major taught me the pop part is very important to me. Um, meaning that when I was solving equation after equation with Avogadro's number or whatever, and I'm like, how many moles are in this? Um, I was bored out of my skull. 
Uh, but when I was listening to a lecture of this is how we discovered this thing, and this is why it's cool, I loved that. Um, absolutely loved it. The, when I was at, at BYU, there was a, um, an astronomy class that was the no math astronomy class. It was actually called, what was, I can't remember what it's called, descriptive astronomy, something like this. That was one of the best classes I ever took um, because, you know, I got A's in calculus. I'm fine with math. I think math is cool, but the math part was not engaging that part of my brain that I felt was making me into a better fantasy science fiction writer, whereas all the concepts were. So I was super excited by those. For me personally, that's what it did, is it taught me to, that I, I don't have to be an actual scientist. I can be a, an armchair scientist and get a lot of the same things that I love out of it. Um, all right, guys, that is our lecture for today. Enjoy having your, uh, your sub next week and give uh, Young Mustard here your, your sheets so you get credit for being here. Camerapanda.com allows you to find cameras and lenses like no other site. Find the Nikon Coolpix cameras with the highest base ISO or Canon cameras with full frame sensors. Find Sony E-mount zoom lenses ordered by Aperture in just three clicks. Camerapanda.com shows you prices from up to 30 different sellers. Camerapanda.com striving to be the world's best camera and lens shopping site.